Good morning. I want to welcome you to uh, Brookings. Uh, I'm uh, Norman Eisen. I'm a senior fellow in governance studies here and uh, to our program today. Uh, the program is being sponsored by Brookings Governance Studies, uh, by Brookings Foreign Policy, and in particular the Center on the United States and Europe, uh, and by the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, uh, a bipartisan uh, coalition of former government officials, uh, think tank members, uh, and experts, uh, uh, co-chaired by myself and uh, Jeff Gedman, who you'll hear from in a moment. Um, we're very pleased uh, to welcome today's uh, 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 audience uh, that is here with us live, as well as those who are joining us on the internet. Uh, for those who are just coming in, there are a few stray seats uh, here and there at the front, and please don't be shy about uh, coming up to the front. Uh, the idea for this um, uh, emergency uh, gathering uh, on uh, Russian aggression on both sides uh, of the Atlantic uh, was we, we call it an emergency gathering because every event that takes place at Brookings requires at least six months advance notice. And we put this one uh, together in a matter of weeks. We were concerned that with the news uh, tsunami, the accelerated news cycle uh, in which we, we all dwell, uh, that um, the um, uh, revelations of recent weeks, the actions uh, of Russia against Ukraine uh, in and around the Sea of Azov, the revelation by Secretary Mattis, uh, that Russian uh, meddling in American elections had continued into the 2018 midterms, uh, that uh, those and, and a like pattern of other events uh, uh, dating back uh, uh, to the uh, episode, the uh, scandal uh, with Georgia, uh, would just be swept back under the rug in the, in the news cycle. So I'm very grateful uh, to um, uh, the co-sponsors of this event, uh, to uh, the Transatlantic Working Group and my co-chair, Jeff, and to our panelists and Mary Louise Kelly, who will lead the panel uh, for attempting to maintain a focus. And today we are not just going to wring our hands about the problem, as profound as it is, uh, but Mary Louise is going to take the panel through a discussion of solutions. And uh, both here at Brookings, in our transatlantic working group, we are going to be pivoting to uh, a deeper analysis and a more enduring analysis of how uh, uh, the uh, friends of democracy um, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic uh, can uh, stand up uh, to these issues. We will hear from our distinguished panelists. I'll let others introduce them. Uh, and then we will have a question and answers uh, from you in the audience. And I will be, I have been designated to monitor my Twitter feed, at Norm Eisen. And for those, um, for those who are uh, 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 either in the audience or are watching uh, from uh, the internet, uh, please do tweet your questions to me. I will pass, you'll see me passing a note or two up to Mary Louise in the Q&A section of the program. So I welcome you all. So pleased uh, that you're here for this um, uh, uh, standing room only event. Uh, I think those stray seats uh, that I talked about have now all been filled. Help yourself uh, to a wonderful uh, morning of discussion and conversation. And with that, I'd like to call up my uh, uh, co-chair, Jeff Gedman, to say a few words and introduce the panel. Thanks, everybody. So, so good morning, everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here at Brookings. Thanks to Brookings and uh, you, Norm, for uh, colleagueship and friendship and the opportunity to, can chair, to chair this um, Transatlantic Democracy Working Group with you. A couple framing thoughts, and then we want to get to the bread and butter, which is the panel and the discussion with you all today. Um, Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, 
the political scientist, Georgetown professor, uh, Ronald Reagan's ambassador to the United Nations, uh, used to say, sometimes we Americans have to face the truth about ourselves no matter how pleasant it is. And one thing that comes to mind is we Americans uh, tend historically to be exceptionally good at forgiving our enemies, if you think about it for just a moment. George Herbert Walker Bush, at that moment, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when suddenly people were talking about German unification, and if you recall, the Soviet Union was against, and Mrs. Thatcher in Britain was against, and the French were against. They were reminding themselves of that adage, we love Germany so much, we're glad there are two of them. Okay, And it was President Bush in the Oval Office who said, with kind of American nonchalance, for Pete's sake, it's time to let a guy up, the Germans, after proving themselves in West Germany a stable, reliable partner in democracy, and that helped lead the process of unification. Similarly, if I may say, with the Soviet Union, when the Soviet Union began dissolving in 1990 and 1991, after seven decades of aggression, after seven decades of tyranny and domination of Central and Eastern Europe, what did the United States and what did NATO do? Just to tick off the list very quickly, in 1991, we reached out and we said, well, we want to cooperate with you, Russia, through the North Atlantic Cooperation Council. In 1994, we said, we've got another idea. We'll call it Partnership for Peace. We need you in, not outside. In the mid-1990s, if you recall, when the newly liberated countries of Central and Eastern Europe wanted to join NATO, what did we do appropriately? We Americans, we debated, we agonized, we fretted because we thought, well, wait a second, they want in, but we don't want to upset Russia. We don't want to provoke Russia. In 2000, Bill Clinton said, if Russia wants to join NATO itself, I don't object. And then you remember President Bush, George W. Bush 43, he met with Putin his first term in Slovenia, famously looked into President Putin's eyes and said, this is a man, or did he, his soul, his eyes, his soul, both, I can't remember all of it. And he said, this is a man I trust, I can work with him. And then by the time we got to President Obama, the first term, President Obama was worried that things were getting wobbly, so he introduced reset, because whatever was wrong or broken, we could fix through good intentions and dialogue. The trouble is, as they say, it does take two to tango. And what did we learn in the last decade and a half? Well, we learned that Russia would launch massive cyber attacks on Estonia. Russia would invade and occupy Georgia. Russia would invade and occupy Ukraine. Russia would launch disinformation campaigns that would make the Soviet Union proud. Russia would interfere in elections in the United States and across Europe, so much so to such an extent that some of our European friends inclined toward dovishness, if I may say, and kind of an accommodating approach to these problems uh, became bewildered, so much so that uh, a friend of mine close to German Chancellor Angela Merkel once said to me, you know, Angela Merkel has a stable relationship and a healthy basis for working with Vladimir Putin. It works like this. She knows that he lies, and he knows that she knows that he lies, and we have no illusions. That brings us up to date, I believe, for the problem of if we assess the situation in a certain way, I suggest we do. There may be quibbles and quarrels today. But if we assess the problem in a certain way, as Norm said, what do we do about it? So for that, we have a kind, gentle panel with Bill Crystal and Sandy Verschbau and others to to walk us through our options, what has worked, what we might consider to advance our interests, defend our values, and of course to reinvigorate our alliance around a problem 
which is a threat to our unity and, in some sense, to our democracies. So with that, we have a great panel. It's my job now to invite them up. Please join me in welcoming them, and we'll get right to the discussion. Welcome. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Okay, great. If that is not the case, please holler as we go. Good morning. I'm Mary Louise Kelly. I am a journalist at NPR. I anchor our afternoon, evening flagship program, All Things Considered. Uh, but I think what has earned me my spot up here today is before that I covered national security and intelligence for many years, which has brought me to Russia uh, a few a few times in these last few years. So we convene, as you have just heard, at a moment of many questions about the state of US-Russia relations, about the state of the transatlantic alliance, about the state of NATO, and about how to respond to Russian aggression, most recently uh, to do with Ukraine, about how to respond to Russian interference in our elections in 2016, uh, maybe again in 2018, and who knows what 2020 may bring. I don't know if... Uh, when you have had occasion, if you've had occasion to travel to Russia in recent years, if you've had the same experience I have, which is this kind of through the looking glass moment, Washington at the moment can be so chaotic that you land in Moscow and think, oh, it's all clear. I have this moment. Of, it's so transparent. I, it all makes sense now. Um, obviously, what's going on beneath the surface is more complicated than that, but on the surface, when you speak to people on the record in Russia, it aligns with Putin's priorities and views. Um, you do not have the complexity of what Angela Stent, who some of you may know from her work here at Brookings and at Georgetown and in the government before then, she's, she's talked about a trifecta, that the US basically has three for, uh, policies toward Russia. There's President Trump's policy, there's his administration's policy, which sometimes aligns and sometimes does not, and then there's Congress. And if you're trying to see this from a Russian point of view, where their system does not work like that, it can be, it can be as perplexed uh, by our system and motives as we are sometimes by theirs. Uh, I was struck by a quote this week where I had to feel for, of all people, Dmitry Peskov, Putin's spokesperson. He was asked about the latest twists and turns in the Mueller investigation, and he said, the Kremlin is pretty tired of trying to keep up with all this, <laughs> to which you can only say, Dimitri, we feel your pain. Um, <laughs> with that, let me welcome our panel, and we're going to dive right in. I'll start at the end with Ambassador Sandy Vershbo, who you may know from the Atlantic Council, former ambassador to NATO, which is relevant to our conversation today, former ambassador to Russia, and most recently to Korea. Welcome. Uh, next along, Alina Polyakova, who is here at Brookings as the David Rubenstein Fellow on Foreign Policy Center on the United States and Europe, uh, and who was born in Ukraine, she was just telling me, so brings that perspective to our conversation. Bill Crystal, uh, who you will know from the Weekly Standard, who's written extensively about Russia and seemingly everything else. <laughs> you are Not prolific. Really. Uh, I don't know how you do it. Welcome. And Andrea Kendall-Taylor, Senior Fellow and Director, Transatlantic Security Program, Center for a New American Security, and recently out of the government yourself. So welcome to you all. We're going to have, as has been laid out for us, the overarching theme of what is Russia up to and what should be done about it. Um, and I want to start with the most recent and ongoing provocation in the Sea of Azov. And put to you, and maybe we'll start with you, Ambassador, and work our way down. What should we make of Russia's actions? Why do they matter? Why should Americans, many of whom uh, would be hard pressed to find this place on a map, why should we care? Okay. Well, thanks very much, and it's great to see such a big crowd interested in trying to solve the insoluble problem mm -hmm. of how to deal with Russia. Uh, 
The events of November 25, uh, on, on, on the one hand, were just a con continuing example of Russian aggressiveness towards Ukraine, but they were significant uh, in, in a number of ways. First of all, it was not an ambiguous uh, act of aggression using little green men and trying to be deniable about it. It was, it was openly an attack by Russia's uh, security services against the forces of a sovereign state. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's important to remember that these events weren't a one-off. It was part of a series of measures that had been rolling out over several months, kind of salami tactics, which the, the Russians are, are masters. Uh, there had been continued artillery and rocket attacks on uh, the Ukrainian forces and civilians in the Donbas uh, all through the year, uh, increasing interference with international shipping through this uh, Kerch Strait and into the Sea of Azov, costing uh, Ukrainian economies billions of of dollars, and uh, Russia imposed sweeping sanctions on Ukrainian business leaders and political leaders at the beginning of November, and then they uh, allowed elections by the so-called separatists uh, later in November uh, in, in the flagrant violation of the Minsk agreements. So uh, all this is, at a minimum, an effort by Russia to kind of uh, further destabilize Ukraine in the run-up to their elections next year to try to show that Ukraine is a failed state that can't defend its own borders. Uh, and I think they may be hoping to bring more pliable leaders to, uh, to power in these elections. But it's, uh, be because this is part of a, a pattern of activity going back several years, I think we have to recognize that Ukraine's very sovereignty and its uh, aspirations for a European future are, are, are being challenged uh, yet again by the Russians. Uh, but also that our credibility uh, in terms of trying to defend the liberal international order, but also to defend Helsinki principles like sovereignty, like territorial integrity, like the right of nations to choose their security relationships. Those two are under direct challenge uh, by the Russians. And so far, the, uh, the US response and the NATO response has been pretty, pretty limp. Uh, basically, there's been no response. Uh, the US has demanded the return of Gone the- limp, it's been non-existent, right? <laughs> yeah, the US has demanded the return of the ships and the sailors who were illegally seized but hasn't kind of said what would happen if the Russians don't do it, and they don't show any sign of being ready to do it. And I think other steps just for this immediate crisis that could be taken, such as beefing up NATO's naval presence in the Black Sea, more security assistance to Ukraine, uh, such as coastal defenses, intelligence and reconnaissance assets, none of that's happened either. So uh, the danger is if Putin feels it with you know, continued salami tactics where we, you know, each, each individual, individual transgression is too small to respond to. Forgive me, he, the term you're using, salami tactics? Yeah, so, so, yeah. Uh, or the other explain. metaphor okay. frequently used okay. is, you know, the, the boiling the frog, you know, turning up the, the flame one or two degrees at a time, the frog doesn't know that he's about to die. And I think the West may not appreciate, you know, what, what it's about to, uh, to do in terms of encouraging Putin to keep going. Right. Uh, and maybe carrying out further aggression, maybe annexing new bits of Ukrainian territory. Uh, but definitely he's trying to, uh, if not topple the government, bring to power leaders who are ready to defer to Russia, accept the sphere of influence, and that would be a big defeat for the West, as well as a crime against the Ukrainian nation and its aspirations for sovereignty. Alina, let me flip this to you. I mean, it, it, the ambassador is describing this as part of a pattern. Is this Russia almost literally testing the waters, waiting to see if there's a big U.S. or NATO or European response, which there hasn't been, but then they could quietly back down. If there hasn't been, then green light. Gates are open. Well, just to take uh, everything that Ambassador Rushbaugh said in a bit of a broader perspective, um, this, this particular... Uh, active aggression in the Azov Sea, as you said, an area where most people have to pull out a Google map to even understand what we're talking about here and why it matters, um, I think is important for three reasons from a bigger perspective. Um, one, what uh, Ambassador Rushbrow was starting to outline is that if we looked at the international response, um, at many countries, including the EU, including NATO, put out these statements of either concern, moderate concern, or deep concern. And that was essentially it. And it took weeks for the EU, for example, even to do that. Exactly. Yeah. It took us also some now, time. Some said deep United concern. Yeah. Yeah. Deep <laughs> serious <laughs> concern. Exactly. <laughs> it was actually quite comical if you put all these together to see these uh, almost cut and paste style statements without um, anything really behind them. I think that what that clearly tells us is that you know, the Russians don't have to continue to test. Uh, that was your question. They already know. Um, we, didn't, we had a very tepid, weak response to Russian uh, military takeover of Crimea. 
Uh, we had a very tepid response to Russian aggression against eastern Ukraine. It goes all the way back to the 2008 war with Georgia. So now the, the Kremlin has over a decade, if not more, of experience knowing exactly how the West will respond. So they know they can keep pushing. That's exactly why they didn't use these little green men. This was an open aggression. It wasn't hidden because they don't need to hide it. And in fact, that calculus has been absolutely correct um, from Putin's perspective. So now they know and they have known for a long time, they can basically do whatever they want in that specific region without much of a response. I think this is absolutely critically important because it's not just about this regional uh, conflict. Uh, it also sets a precedent for China. Trust me, they're looking at the Western response to Russian aggression, the, sl the slow creep, um, and they're looking at their own uh, territorial aspirations for the South China Sea, for the East Asia Sea, and others around the world as well. And so I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we ready to draw those red lines and follow through um, if we don't want to really undermine the stability of the international order, which has already been undermined significantly? All right. Thank you. Bill, hop in. What do you make of what's going on in these last few weeks? I, mean, I think I, I, I have the privilege of knowing less about Russia than anyone else on this panel, so I, you, I will benefit, I hope, from the yes. soft bigotry of low advantage. expectations. <laughs> and, uh, I've never been there, unfortunately. And, um, I'm not sure I'm going to be going in the very near future, so. Um, but I have followed, obviously, these events, and uh, I am so cheered up as an old cold warrior to see this hashtag Russian aggression. It really brings, <laughs> brings me back to my first days in Washington in 1985. The reason I came to Washington, like so many people of my generation and of my persuasion, was basically the Cold War and to help in that fight. And so we're back in a, in a somewhat different fight. I mean, I would, look, I, I have no great insights. I, 08, I think the combination of 08 and the reaction, or not too much of a reaction to it, and, and 14 with Ukraine um, is pretty devastating. Uh, it, you know, 14, Ukraine wasn't, obviously it wasn't, isn't part of NATO, but there, there was a direct treaty obligation, I would say, from when they gave up the nuclear weapons that in some ways you could almost argue is not stronger, obviously, than Article 5, but a very serious obligation uh, which was being just directly challenged and, and uh, flouted by, by Putin or almost taunted, taunting us to do anything. I think he learned a lot from that. I very much agree uh, that, uh, with Elena that the, you know, the world is one. We have Middle East experts and Russia experts and panels on Russia and panels on China and Japan. But of course, uh, the world is <laughs> one world. People look at what's happening elsewhere. U.S. credibility is... It, 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 you know, indivisible in a certain way, not entirely. People understand we have different obligations to different parts of the world, to different countries. I'll just tell one very quick story. I was in Japan, which I also know very little about. In November 13, with this group of foreign policy types, you know, editors of magazines, think tank guys, and uh, mostly Republican-ish, and um, it was November 13. <coughs> and we actually, Prime Minister Abe, who had been in power maybe a year, wanted to meet with us. Uh, and so it was very sort of formal meeting. They had the cameras in there, you know, at the beginning. Uh, he was showing he could you know, meet with uh, alleged big shots. Little did they know. But anyway, out of power types from, from the U.S. Um, we had about six, seven of us, I don't know, I think from Brookings, but people from familiar think tanks, you know, around town, more on the center right side, I guess. And uh, I remember before the meeting, we said, well, you know, this is going to be one of these formal meetings where there'll be the prime minister in one seat and then the sort of, you know, the head of state normally in the other seat, but since someone has to, you know, is a head of state, so who's the senior member of our delegation who gets to sit across from the prime minister and, and sort of begin the conversation? And I was the oldest and had been in government two decades before and vaguely remembered maybe how these things are supposed to work, so I was selected. And so at the beginning of the meeting, uh, their cameras leave, uh, and uh, there, you know, there are people are lined up, saying, he's been related to these things, you know, to uh, along the couch, and I'm there with Abe and Prime Minister Abe and a translator behind us. And I vaguely remembering from two decades before maybe how to do this. So first the Prime Minister, thank you so much for having us. We're great staunch supporters of the U.S.-Japan relationship. And I start to blither on for two or three minutes to sort of the appropriate, you know, courtesies. And he interrupts me in English, which he understands, I guess, and speaks some, obviously wouldn't speak in a formal, you know, diplomatic setting, but this was a small group and not, not really, a, uh, nothing crucial at, at stake in what words he chose. And he interrupted me and said, Mr. Crystal, if you mind, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, certainly, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, and he said, what happened in Syria? <laughs> 
And it actually was so like out of context, of course, that I actually thought for a minute that is Syria some little island in the East China Sea that I don't know about? And I'm desperately looking at the people in our delegation who actually know about East Asia. You know, it's like, is there something I missed here? Um, and then I realized he was talking about the red line. And he was worried. And he said he had just come from the ASEAN meeting. And the main discussion had been that President Obama, and I'm not getting into the merits of all this and whether it's fair or unfair, but what did President Obama's failure to follow through, or let's just say the U.S.'s failure to follow through, follow through since the Congress has some responsibility here, uh, on the red line uh, in Syria around Labor Day of 2013, did that affect sort of our commitment to Japan? And I found myself in the slightly comical position of reassuring the Japanese Prime Minister that no, on that issue, I, and I really did believe, of course, that on that, I was defending President, Ob you know, President Obama, both parties are, are you know, pretty seriously committed to the U.S.-Japan relationship, and he shouldn't overinterpret this. This was a particularly difficult situation, et cetera, et cetera. But it really brought home to me how much it is about U.S. credibility. And I do think, and it wasn't maybe entirely an accident, I'm not familiar with Russian decision-making and timing, but I'm not sure it was entirely an accident that it was, what, a few months later that Putin goes into Ukraine. So I do think at the end of the day, the, the Russia problem is an America problem. It's very much compounded by the current administration, obviously. Uh, and with an administration that isn't willing to be forceful, to say the least, how much our European allies can do to get ahead of us. I think they're not, you're not doing as badly as one might have expected, but of course I remember, for, and Sandy knows this so much better, for what, really 15 years under Bush and, President Bush and Obama, it was the U.S. complaining about the Europeans being unwilling to be tough right. on Russia. Right. Now we're in the situation where the Europeans are probably a little better than they were actually, and we're not. And I, so I'm, I'm sort of gloomy about the current moment. You raise a couple of themes that we'll follow up on. But Andrea, let me let you get in on this first question of stay with the, the theme of Russian decision making and game this out from how this looks from Moscow and from the Kremlin's point of view. Why pick this fight with Ukraine and, and why now? Yeah, I think it's important to add to the great points that the panelists have already made, but to kind of step back and put this in that broader context of what the view looks like from Moscow. Um, but before I do that, I also think it's really worth um, highlighting or underscoring that this incident in the Sea of Azov, I think, caught a lot of Western observers by surprise. Um, it <coughs> is true that tensions between Russia and Ukraine had been escalating for some time around the Sea of Azov, but I think the particular timing of the event and also um, kind of the sheer blatantness by which uh, Russia instigated this particular provocation um, was surprising by many. I think the conventional wisdom had really been um, that Russia had little incentive to destabilize the status quo, that Russia was largely satisfied with the way that things were going in Ukraine. Um, you know, they had basically thwarted any forward progress on resolving the conflict, and Ukrainian President Poroshenko was, who they opposed, was, you know, hugely unpopular heading into elections in Ukraine in March. Um, and yet, the Russians were willing to take this action. Um, and for me, it underscores, again, this is another instance, I think, where Russia was able to take the West by surprise. And it also underscores, I think, just how hard it is for Russia watchers to um, project with foresight just how far Russia is willing to go to advance its mm -hmm. national interests. In hindsight, it does fit a long uh, pattern of rising Russian assertiveness on the international stage since Putin returned to power in 2012. So if we think about when Putin came back, he came back in the wake of um, significant protests in 2011 and 2012 um, over alleged electoral fraud. They were the biggest protests, most significant protests had seen, or Russia had seen since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And they were also on the tail of the Arab Spring, which unseated four of the world's longest standing dictators. And so from Putin's perspective, this underscores his belief that the United States is looking to um, unseat regimes we perceive as unfriendly and that we had our design, you know, we had designs on Russia itself. Um, there were also some changes domestically for Putin. You know, in his first two terms in office, 2000 to 2008, oil prices were incredibly high. That made it much easier for Putin to keep people happy, to share the spoils with the elite. Um, and he was largely popular because he had such success containing the insurgency in the North Caucasus. But the Putin that returns in 2012 no longer has those alternative mechanisms of control. And so kind of his diminished popularity along with this belief or this fear of the West sets him down a path of a much more assertive foreign policy. And I think that's really paid dividends. The view from Moscow is you know, success in thwarting forward progress on resolving the Ukrainian conflict, 
Um, the intervention in Syria where they totally shifted battlefield dynamics and shored up Bashar al-Assad in power. Uh, it's then using their intervention in Syria really as a springboard to increase influence throughout the Middle East, including with a, long, uh, a lot of longtime allies and partners, including Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Um, they position themselves to at least play a role and shape events in Libya, North Korea, Afghanistan, um, and even kind of beyond Putin's actions, um, when he looks out in Europe, he definitely calculates that he's benefiting hugely from what's happening in Europe. Um, you know, the, the kind of dysfunction, the chaos suits his purposes. His purposes. Yeah. And it's, it feeds this narrative um, that Russia advances <coughs> along with China um, that democracies don't deliver. They're chaotic, they're ineffective, they're dysfunctional. Um, and so the authoritarian alternative is more important. So when he looks out at Europe, you've got a UK that's totally consumed by Brexit chaos. A Sweden who hasn't been able to put a government in power since elections they held in September. Russia, or Hungary and Poland are testing the resilience of European institutions. Um, Italy has a populist government that's vocally um, advocated for lifting sanctions on Russia. And so all of these things are benefiting Russia hugely. And then you kind of juxtapose this kind of chaos in the West with, I think, some momentum that he's looking, coordination and, and collaboration that he's fostering among authoritarian counterparts. Hmm. Um, and the picture, I think, from Russia looks quite good. You know, you, in 2017, you had the very first visit by a Saudi king to Russia. Um, they just had a very high-profile visit. Venezuelan President Maduro was there in Moscow. And so there is this kind of... Um, camaraderie, collaboration, it's worth, you know, Russia-China relations are deeper than they've been. Russia-Iranian relations are at a historic high, largely based on their shared interest in countering the United States and the Middle East. So I think the Sea of Azov, this, from Putin's perspective, I think he's feeling quite confident. And, I, and as I'm sure we'll kind of turn to now, it really raises the stakes, I think, for the West to be able to confront the rules-breaking behavior and to try to stem some of this momentum that I think Putin really thinks is on his side. Well, and just briefly to follow up on something you touched on, is it also is part of the calculation also that if you're trying to rally domestic support, which has fallen off since his re-election this spring, that it helps to have, to have a fight. It helps to have an enemy if you're trying to rally the population behind you. And he can say, look, we've, we've got you know, Russian ships defending the country and defending Russian sovereignty in this important area. I think that's one narrative that we've definitely heard. I, I tend to put less stock in that narrative. I think um, I don't think Putin is necessarily concerned about his popularity. He's down to 60%, and it's not at the 80% where he was before. Um, but my sense is that he feels pretty secure. That it's a he's pretty gonna, big drop off just since March. It is. It's a drop, but I think I think that would be kind of on the you know, a, a secondary or even like a, a lower down on the decision calculus. American leaders would kill for 60% yeah, exactly. ratings. Yeah. Yes, Sandy. Yeah, I would agree that, uh, while Putin does watch his polls very carefully, uh, that's not his main concern. But I do agree with, with Andrea's earlier point that a lot of this is driven by his insecurity about his position domestically, fear of regime change, conviction that the West's strategy is regime change. And in this, he's not, uh, he's not afraid of NATO or military threats. He's afraid of Western ideas, Western values, and uh, our, our effort to, to spread those, at least up until this administration. Uh, but, uh, but because of what he saw in 2012 in Russia and the toppling of Gaddafi, uh, I think Putin sees himself at war with the West and with Western values. And while there's many fronts in this war, including the domestic front in Europe, in the United States, and we, in terms of the information war, subversion, disinformation, effort, effort to discredit or, or at least sow doubts about the, uh, the strengths of, of, of our democratic values and institutions. But the main front for Putin is Ukraine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the hardest part of the battle for us to wage. I mean, we can do a lot in terms of deterring direct aggression, and NATO is uh, still on track, even with the, with the histrionics by the president about defense spending. You know, NATO is still continuing to improve its deterrence posture. Uh, you know, we have to, have to do a lot at home to at least reduce our vulnerability to the disinformation and subversion, expose what the Russians are up to, uh, recognizing that it's probably never going to stop, but at least we can make ourselves less vulnerable. But supporting the countries in between, which Putin clearly wants to resubjugate to some kind of new Soviet Union light or whatever you want to call it, Yalta II, uh, 
uh, that's where we, uh, we we're, we're kind of ho holding the line, but, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not even a standoff. I think the events uh, in recent weeks in the Azov Sea just remind us that Putin has many tricks up his sleeve. Mm. And between, between now and the Ukrainian, Ukrainian elections, there's something dramatic could happen that we haven't imagined. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, the fact that the, uh, this bridge may be on, on shifting sands and it may not, uh, uh, may not last for more than a few more months, but what will happen if it collapses, Putin will blame the Ukrainians, say Ukrainian terrorists, who, by the way, he already said were on those ships that they seized, uh, uh, use that as a pretext for some much more decisive military blow against the Ukrainians and you know, we'll be, uh, I think, scrambling as we are right now. All right, well, let's explore what pushing back against Russia might look like. And Alina, I'm going to throw this at you first. Everybody else, please chime in as you have thoughts. You, you described in your opening remarks drawing red lines and what that would look like and how Russia, not to mention China, and the rest of the world is watching this. So what does that look like? What would cause Russia pain? What would cause Putin to rethink? Maybe this isn't the right way to be going to be proceeding on the world stage. Right. That's the big question. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the million dollar question. Um, you know, and I think what um, Andrea was pointing to, this notion that we keep being surprised. Right? So the question to my mind is, how do we avoid getting surprised and how do we actually get ahead of uh, understanding the threat that Russia represents and having you know, a realistic threat assessment of you know, Putin's ability to take risks, uh, his capacities and capabilities, meaning the Russian military and non-military capacities and capabilities to cause harm in the near abroad and also in, in the West. Um, and I think we would, there's one place we could look at um, to not be caught by surprise, which is of course Ukraine. And I'm not just talking about what happened recently, uh, but in terms of this broad political warfare uh, that the Kremlin has waged against the West, cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns that all of us have now have too much familiarity with, I think, in the United States. And again, we were surprised in 2016 by the yeah. Russian operations here to try to influence uh, the U.S. election. But of course, Russia has been doing this in Ukraine, at least since 2004. Uh, Ukraine's the country that has been the test bed of attacks on critical infrastructures, electrical grids, and blackouts. Right. Um, this has been happening relatively consistently. Uh, and so I think for us to understand what we might see come here, we should look at what's happened in Ukraine over the last 10 years and also in Georgia. And I think that tells us a few things. Uh, one, uh, we need to be realistic that Russia is not 10 feet tall. Um, it is a declining power in some ways, as people say, economically, demographically, yet the big conundrum and the paradox and why it's been so difficult to craft an effective deterrence policy against Russia is because it is still a global player despite being, or because of being a declining power, that is constantly, desperately trying to cling uh, to everything. Um, just to give you one quick example, just um, I read a news story just this morning um, that there was you know, a Russian television rival show where they showed off this new robot uh, that was supposed to be, you know, it, it was walking, it was talking, really advanced robotics. It turns out this was a person in a robot suit, <laughs> uh, but that was never fairly presented. And I think this, to my mind, encapsulates what Russia really is. It's a country that has great aspirations, but not the capabilities and capacities. And so just to go to the very last uh, specific ideas of what can be done, I think we need to focus not on the military space, because we do have the infrastructure there, and I agree we need to shore up the eastern flank of NATO. We're already doing that. This administration is actually doing that in a quite effective way, I would say. Uh, but how do we craft a deterrent strategy when it comes to information warfare, when it comes to cyber attacks? And the basics of a deterrent strategy is basically saying, um, if you do X, here's consequence Y. And that message needs to be sent by the president, first and foremost. It needs to be sent quietly between the intelligence community, uh, between the military uh, relations uh, between the United States and Russia. Uh, but that is what I think we need to start thinking about, um, is what are those sets of consequences they're willing to impose? Because the sanctions regime, obviously, as uh, good as it has been, I think, has not deterred Russian right. aggression. You know, just what happened in Ukraine seems an obvious counterexample to that. Um, and so the question is, can we, will sa are sanctions the appropriate policy tool? Well, Steve, yeah, just to quickly follow on your point about messaging, do you buy this theory that, that 
the messaging from the U.S. is confusing even if you're here, and certainly from the outside. Congress is all for sanctions. Not clear that the rest of the U.S. government is. Does, how, how much does that complicate things? Well, absolutely from the Russian perspective, just from like anybody's perspective, not just the Russians. Um, exactly. Yes, there, this gap between uh, rhetoric and policy I think is difficult for the Russians to interpret, also because they have a consistent um, kind of misreading of the role of the U.S. Congress, because the Russian parliament, the Russian Duma, has no uh, effective power in Russia. It's a rubber stamp parliament. So they always misread and misinterpret the power that Congress actually has to push uh, the administration to take certain actions like sanctions. I mean, but certainly, you know, P uh, Peskov, as, as you mentioned, when uh, the G20 meeting was canceled just recently by President Trump, they learned about it through the tweet just like everybody else did. Uh, so they said, right? So to them, the, this just, um, I think, is very confusing. The Russians, despite everything, are really keen on protocol, I think, mm -hmm. as, as Sandy knows from being an ambassador there. So I do think that the messages uh, that we're sending um, are not serving that deterrence effective function. Yeah, I think that's really important. But it's not just confusing, it undermines the whole policy that follows behind it. So we all know that, like, ru that the Russians um, see divisions as opportunity. So as long as there's a division between Trump, or even a perceived division between Trump and the rest of the administration, the Russians will continue to see opportunity. Putin will continue to see opportunity. Right. And it's no longer an effective deterrent, no but, matter what we do. But there's also the problem that even though the president has disappointed them, probably in terms of delivering the you know, cost-free reset, which they may have been hoping for two years ago, uh, at the same time the Russians exaggerate in their own minds the role of domestic uh, Russophobia, mm -hmm. you know, hatred of Russia. Uh, as the reason why we're not able to engage with them and cooperate more. I think they, they underestimate the fundamental differences uh, in terms of aggression against sovereign states and uh, interfering internal affairs of, 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 of our country and of our allies. They, th they think we would kind of gladly sweep that under the rug if it weren't for domestic pressure on Trump. Uh, so maybe they uh, underestimate, maybe they overestimate the, the role of Congress, but Congress has filled the gap. You know, you know, Sort of pushing the administration to tighten sanctions when the administration at the beginning mm -hmm. was ready to, to waive mm -hmm. them all unilaterally. Bill. Uh, I suppose one thing I would say is, I think if the question is how do we respond to this particular action uh, in that same sphere, or how do we deter a subsequent action in, the, action in that same sphere, that's a difficult question and, a, and a, I think a too much of a self-limiting question for the U.S. So they go into Georgia, Senator McCain says we're all Georgians now, he's widely ridiculed by all, by by most of uh, the foreign policy establishment, I would say, and certainly by his opponent in the presidential election, and nothing happens much. Uh, Bush doesn't even do very much, and uh, you know they learn a lesson from that. They go to Syria, obviously in a big way, uh, <coughs> violating, what, 35 years of U.S. policy of keeping the U.S., keeping Russia out of the Middle East. Uh, they get away with that, but the daunting challenge, what are we gonna do now? We're gonna go into Syria more aggressively? No one really, I mean, I would, but almost no one else has a stomach for that, so, so that's not going to happen. Ukraine, 2014, same problem. You could do, get them a little few more arms, and I don't mean to minimize that, but ultimately, are we gonna really do too much? The intervention even here in 2016, which incidentally we should not minimize, of all these different sequence of events, getting away with intervening in the U.S. debate during an election campaign is kind of a big deal. I would also say poisoning people in major NATO allies uh, who have been given safe haven is kind of a big deal, and it would have been sort of a, had a pretty big response in the Cold War, mm -hmm. and a pretty big response anywhere. I mean, it's just sort of an unusual thing to do, you know, against another sovereign power. Uh, so what each of the, but each, if you think of each of these things as, well, how do we respond in an appropriate way in that sphere, you're going to have trouble, and I think the way to think about it is less that and more, okay, what is the whole arsenal we have at our disposal to make Putin's life miserable. And it doesn't have to be in the same area. The response to Ukraine doesn't have to be Ukraine specific. The response to, the, to uh, Syria doesn't uh, have to be Middle East specific. And we have a lot of ways, I would think, to make Putin's life much less happy and cozy than it is right now. Uh, and I have no sense that the U.S. government is doing a heck of a lot to look at these ways. What, what, what is that arsenal? Cyber, I mean, do you want to, I mean, this, well, what is the whole arsenal that at our disposal to make one, Putin's I'll, life miserable? Well, I'll mention one, which is very targeted use of cyber to make his financial operations and his financial comfort and his friends and oligarchs' financial operations and comfort extremely miserable. And that, and that can be done by sanctions, but it can also be done by a lot of covert actions. Maybe we're doing some of them. The Panama Papers style leaks. 
which mm -hmm. I'm convinced were an intelligence leak. You think that got under his skin? Absolutely. There's been multiple reports that got very, very close. And the, the environment in Russia, the political environment, is that even the anti-corruption opposition crusaders um, know never to touch Putin uh, because they know that there'll be consequences for their livelihood for that. But that's clearly a sore point, and that's clearly somewhere where our intelligence can have a big impact. Mm -hmm. NATO. Speaking of organizations set up with the express purpose of containing and countering Russia, talk to me about the state of NATO. And I, and I, I will say my context is I was in Europe anchoring NPR from London and then from Helsinki in that remarkable week where that began with the NATO summit in Brussels and then President Trump went on to the UK for what we thought would be a boring visit and was anything but, and then ended up in Helsinki, which was definitely not a boring summit. I was in the room in the presidential palace in Helsinki as that press conference unfolded, which is the t another thing we could talk about, spend an hour on. Um, but to the role of NATO, uh, Lena, you, you mentioned in your view that you described the shoring up the eastern flank of NATO and that that's actually going pretty well. I mean, I will leave the specifics of the <laughs> NATO um, alliance to our former ambassador. Um, but, you know, if we just look at the spending numbers um, that this administration has committed um, to U.S. spending, mil shoring up our military presence in the Baltic states, in Europe's eastern members like Poland, um, that amount is $6.5 billion, which uh, is a huge increase from, I believe it was around 700-something million um, in the last year of the Obama administration. So that's a huge increase over a very, very short period of time. And we are now uh, thinking more about how to really defend the Baltic states. There's a very famous study, um, I mean, not very famous, fam very famous in my world, um, <laughs> uh, that, that assessed that- get a life. <laughs> you know what I'm talking I, about. I know exactly right? what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I do too. <laughs> um, that Russia could basically uh, take over Estonia in like 60 hours, if not less than that. And so that's a huge liability. But I think in terms of our military presence, um, it, that uh, continues to be a point of debate that I think Sandy could speak to. Yeah. Now, this is one of those cases where there's the, you know, the Trump administration policy, which has been superb, it's you know, even better than Obama, continuing on a, on a lot of tracks that were started under the Obama administration, but definitely both doing more under the European Deterrence Initiative to bolster the U.S. posture in Europe, uh, which depends heavily on rapid reinforcement, but getting the allies to do more, uh, coming up with new initiatives that were the kind of the good news from the Brussels summit on readiness and military mobility, you know, technical but very important in terms of the credibility of deterrence. But at the same time, there's still this anxiety that the president could kind of pull the rug out from under uh, all these good things you know, because of his inconsistent uh, support for the Article 5 commitment, you know, his comments about uh, Montenegro starting a war, why should I have to defend Montenegro? Uh, and uh, his you know, continued bashing of the European Union, which is these days playing a very complementary role in actually trying to help solve problems of mobility and you know, funding infrastructure that will enable trains with a heavy load of tanks to actually cross Europe uh, safely and quickly. So uh, there's always this anxiety in Brussels, which came out in the second day of the summit when the president had his tantrum, uh, even though the communique, thank God, had already been approved, uh, that caused the Europeans to wonder whether you know, this commitment could kind of suddenly disappear just when uh, push comes to shove with the Russians. So uh, nevertheless, you know, we, you know, actions do speak louder than words, and the, and the actual policies and the, the spending uh, it's good news, and Trump has, you know, shamed the Europeans into spending more than they might have done uh, otherwise. There's I, mean, I would say to counter that, words sometimes speak louder than actions. I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> though, or words the act, are actions, of course, and I don't minimize all that, but there's a little bit of the, I think someone used this famous phrase, retail sanity and wholesale madness to describe policies or ways of thinking where the individual things that happen are reasonable, you know, it's if the whole thing is just nuts, you know, so that in Vietnam, very particular decisions were made that were perfectly reasonable and well thought out by extremely intelligent people and executed pretty well in certain cases. But at the end of the day, if you're going in the wrong direction or uh, into a quagmire or whatever, or down a rabbit hole, whatever metaphor you like, it's a certain kind of madness. And I do worry about that with Trump. As my friends, typically I have a few in the <coughs> Trump administration or Trump world are very big on these actions, and I don't minimize them at all because in the real world they matter. I take that point. On the other hand, doing nothing about Russian destabilization of major 
NATO members in Central and Eastern Europe, to say nothing of core NATO members, if that, that using this distinction colloquially not, I don't know if it's a real distinction, but you know, in Western Europe, uh, and having a U.S. administration that seems to think it's just fine, that you know, riots in the streets of Paris, that's not, you know, let's, let's cheer them on a little bit, because you know, those often end well in history, you know, <laughs> right? mob violence in France really has a great history of, uh, I mean, that is really bad news, and mm. so I think I'm all for doing what you can do, and if what you can do is the retail actions, we need to do them, but I am very worried that the broader America first, contempt for our fellow democracies, tolerance, not to say rationalization, of authoritarians around the world. Uh, you know, the, the Saudi-Russia thing is actually a kind of a wonderful symbol of this, I think. Um, and the is, handshake at the yeah, G20. Yeah, it's fair, yeah the, the kind of yeah, high five at the G20 of the two murderers cheerfully reassuring themselves that basically they're both going to get away with it. Um, I mean, that really is, I'm not just trying to be gloom and gloom, but I think we, we need to confront that because really in terms of, and this is where Congress can do some things because Congress doesn't have, can also do very narrow things, and, which they've done a decent job on, I guess, and sanctions and so forth, but they can also at least make clear that Trump's view of American foreign policy, of course, will be dominant for the next couple of years, presumably, but isn't the permanent view going forward. I do think that's extremely important. The people I've talked to, and I think everyone on the stage talks to more foreign leaders and diplomats than I do, but I think it, would make a, it makes a big difference in people's minds if they think, it's kind of a weird moment. We have to get through this. We have to manage some of the retail stuff and manage the bigger stuff as much as we can, and we'll sort of reemerge reasonably. Or this is sort of the future the of new America. Normal. The new normal. Yeah. If this is the new normal, all the retail stuff is good. You ain't seen this, nothing yet. Yeah, then, we're really, <laughs> then we are really in deep trouble. Andrea. Yeah, just to make one more point on the NATO question, I think everything that you guys said about um, NATO is doing a lot of things right. There was a very successful 2018 summit um, on the kind of defensive posture, NATO is looking strong, more commitments to do more to counter Russian aggression and the kind of below article, sub article five um, types of activities like hybrid, NATO is doing more and more along those lines. But I think the thing that I am also concerned maybe to add a little bit to the bad news is what's happening within NATO countries themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's the democratic decline and, the, demo and the, the slow kind of erosion of democracy that I think will have significant implications for the cohesion of the alliance, for it, the capacity of NATO member states to coordinate um, at the, the, ex, the, the close coordination that will be required to confront emerging challenges, not just from Russia, but migration, terrorism, and all these other things. And talking so about the rise of authoritarian In NATO countries themselves. So what's NATO happening countries. in Hungary and Poland, that is creating divisions within NATO that I think have the potential to affect the kind of the operational capacity of the alliance. And that's really concerning. And, that, and it, I think that is something that, that Putin will be taking note of. Let me make this personal. Uh, the G20, Putin and Trump were going to meet, then they weren't going to meet, then they were going to meet, then they weren't, and then as was mentioned, uh, we all learned by tweet that they weren't going to meet. Am I right in thinking you've written, they should have met. This, this could have been really constructive. Yeah. Persuade me, because I was at Helsinki. <laughs> why, why would that have been a good idea? Yeah, I think there, there certainly were a lot of people who um, thought canceling the meeting was the right course of action because there, you know, people rightly said that I think President Trump didn't have the the desire to deliver the strong messages that were required at, at the G20 summit. Um, I, that's true, um, but I think from my perspective, um, the, it's important that we talk about what the president should be doing to, a, to advance national interests. When we kind of drop that should from talking about what we expect of the president, I feel like we're going down a slippery slope, um, that if we're not laying out the criteria through which we kind of evaluate a president's performance, then we lose that mechanism of accountability. How do we make the case to American people if we're not talking about what the president should be doing? And I also think there were a few kind of downsides to, to, not, to not meeting. So the Russians essentially, I think, took away the same message from Trump canceling the meeting as they would have from a poor performance. Hmm. By Trump canceling the meeting, the Russians still concluded that um, Trump doesn't have the desire to stand up to Russian rules breaking and doesn't have the desire to confront the Kremlin head on. And so this really was a key opportunity to deliver the strong messages that Alina was talking about. Um, and, and, and so for that, it was, a, it was a lost opportunity. Anybody else want to agree, disagree? Yeah, well, I, I sort of agree in theory, but not necessarily in practice. Uh, right. Because yes, 
it would have been an opportunity to read him the riot act on the uh, Sea of Azov situation and also uh, on INF violations. And there are other important issues that we do need to talk to the Russians about just to kind of manage uh, crisis situations, prevent the relationship from getting even worse than it is. Uh, you know, North Korea, Syria, you could take a long list. The problem is, would Trump have done that or would it have been a repeat of Helsinki where he buys Putin's, uh, you know, lying through his teeth or about... Where we don't exactly yeah, know what exactly happened. It's all happened Ukraine's lying. fault, it's all somebody else's fault, uh, and there was no interference, and Trump says, you know, because you've, you denied it so vigorously, I will believe your denial. Uh, so, you know, in theory, it would have been nice, but maybe we were all spared another Helsinki. And I would qualify it in this way. I think, I mean, I'm all for holding him to appropriate standards of presidential behavior and, and sound foreign policy, but I, I think not at the expense, and we're all executive branch types here, in a way, not of the, I mean, what in the real world? I don't think he's going to do that. And you know, so where are we? Well, where we are is you do have a U.S. Congress. Uh, we have new chairman of the relevant committees coming in in both houses, either because of retirement or switch of party control. Certainly, of foreign relations, and I think actually that would be true of the others. Well, certainly in the House of all committees, uh, and in the Senate, new leadership and, and the key committees, and they really need, in my opinion, this is a more practical thing to urge. They need to act like serious committee chairman once did, and even in recent memory did, or serious members of Congress did, leave aside if they're chairman of anything, but, and actually speak for the country and show leadership and really advance legislation and make arguments uh, and meet with people abroad. You know, you're allowed if you're chairman of the Senate for Foreign Relations or Senate Armed Services Committee to actually meet with foreign leaders. I believe Sandy must have uh, ushered through people in many, many meetings. And, you know, they, McCain, Kerry, people like that were actually important in shaping overall U.S. foreign policy. Not as important as the president, not as important as the secretary of state, obviously. And now there's people, and the passivity over the last couple of years, which has mostly been an intra-Republican problem, I will grant, but that needn't be the case anymore, obviously, in the House. And I would say in the Senate, there's a change in leadership. I don't know how that'll work out, but they at least should feel somewhat emboldened, I would hope, to behave like serious uh, leaders in the American political system and not merely as sort of minor league functionaries in the president's party, or frankly on the Democratic side, sort of minor league critics of the president. I mean, that, they could really do some good. I mean, in the real world, those, pe those committee chairs and other members and pe even backbenchers who just know a lot could do more good than they have. They did a lot of good in the past, Ben Cardin and others on Magnitsky and stuff. Uh, that was not a huge Obama administration priority, to say the least, um, and uh, taking on his own party and some president of his own party. But uh, that's really dissipated. The, the absence of Senator McCain in particular, obviously, I think is very, is very damaging. Alina. I just quickly before we, I think, uh, get some feedback from the audience, I uh, want to go back to what Andrea brought up, if I may, to kind of pan out from these questions about NATO institutions and military spending, all of that. Um, you know, just a big picture of democratic decline and recession and the attacks on democracy in what we thought were countries that are well on their path uh, towards, you know, the end of history, uh, this liberal democratic path. And now we see this profound backlash against that um, that is undermining these multilateral institutions, not just NATO, but also the EU. And of course, we're talking about Hungary, which just expelled a university. Uh, we're talking about Poland, uh, where the government has been pushing uh, to basically make the judiciary branch irrelevant. Uh, to try to consolidate power. And we see similar warning signs in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia. And if we pan out a little bit further, you know, Turkey um, as a NATO member state is a huge issue. Uh, but I also think, you know, just to connect a few threads here, you know, we talked a bit about what's happening in France right now and, and the protests there. And I've seen some quite disturbing commentary um, that uh, Russia's really behind all this, right? that we're, try we're seeing the Russia hand everywhere. When we see our own domestic internal problems, people's real grievances being expressed about their concerns of the quality of life, uh, to have a conversation where this is blamed on an external force. And I just want to you know, say a word of caution that yes, of course, uh, this goes back to the notion that Russia is not capable of that. If Russia was capable of inciting mass protests that are you know, presenting the biggest political crisis in a major Western European country, uh, they were in deep trouble, okay? That's deep trouble. That's not what's happening here. What's happening here is that our, in our own societies, uh, we're seeing what has been a very slow simmering and now an explosion of momentum for these anti-liberal, you could say, counter-democratic political forces 
Um, and the demonstrations in France are also this, I think, emotional, it seems like an emotional explosion against some real grievances. And so I think we have to understand that first and foremost, we need to shore up our democratic institutions at home because other adversaries, not just Russia, will exploit our weaknesses and divisions. They can't make them, they can't create them, but they will exploit them. And I think having a more coherent understanding of what that means also presents a very clear set of policy solutions, right? And so how do we shore up the transatlantic community's commitment to democratic norms and values? Uh, how do we make those appealing to a younger generation which doesn't see the value of democracy in the way their parents did, that think military rule is not so bad, right? And I think connecting those with the external threats we face um, is, is the real challenge that, that I think we should be talking about and here. I just to underscore, I mean, I couldn't agree more with what Alina just said, and also just to add a, like one complicating factor is also the China question. Yeah, of course. So we haven't yet talked about that, and I think it's worth noting that there is kind of a deepening and broadening of relations between Russia and China. And so that type of um, approach that Alina just described, the shoring up and building the resilience of, of democratic societies is not only effective for countering Russia, but it's also that you know a very successful approach for dealing with a rising China. Right. And I would just say, kind of the other way a little bit. You can have a lot of deep problems, and they are real problems, and they should be addressed, and they would manifest themselves anyway. But just that extra ten or twenty percent from Russian intervention that matters too. It's like you're in the hospital, you got this disease, and you have this problem, and these things are all very serious. And then just a little infection can make things a lot more. Uh, a lot riskier, a lot more toxic, and I think the Russians I mean, are pretty good at exploiting these things. Doesn't help to call it all a hoax. <laughs> yeah, no, and I think so. Look, and honestly, it may be the easiest thing in the very short term to push back on. So I totally agree. We shouldn't delude ourselves that this is somehow fantastically brilliant Russian but it machinations. Amplifies. Yeah. It amplifies, and it's something we could de-amplify conceivably, right. or counter-amplify, or amplify in the other direction in places the Russians don't want to see this kind of thing happen. Good. Very important context. I'm going to open it up to questions. We have two microphones, so raise your hand. We will get a mic to you. We'll hope to squeeze in a few of you. Please start. tell us your name. If you have an affiliation you want to share, let us know. And please make your question a question. If it's a speech, I will cut you off. Uh, I just saw this gentleman in the second row first, so we'll bring it right to you here. Morning. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to deal with foreign policy issues. <laughs> Hold the issues. mic a little bit. Uh, yep. Uh, Basil Scarless used to deal with foreign policy issues. Uh, I have a question. And I'd like to ask the panel whether what specific actions would they recommend to counter Russian aggression? And particularly, given recent developments, political developments in Germany, would, they, would the panel think that uh, Germany canceling Nord Stream 2 would be an effective action against Russia's recent aggression uh, targeting Ukraine? All right. And I'll repeat in case y'all couldn't hear that in the back. Specifically, what should be done to counter Russia? And look at the German example of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. I, I can start on Nord Stream 2. If you okay, I, I was, was going to say, we, you know, we, we have to respond, first of all, to this immediate challenge in the Sea of Azov. If the Russians don't return the ships, for example, we should have some, some targeted sanctions, you know, banning Russian ships from European ports or something like that. Uh, uh, and I think, by the way, that you know, sanctions have worked uh, to, a, to a point. And they've, I think, deterred the Russians from even uh, more uh, aggressive behavior in Ukraine, taking more territory back in 2014-15. They may not have fundamentally changed Russia's calculus, but you know, the, I think the bigger problem on sanctions is that Europe isn't doing enough. I mean, we have an agreement from 2014. Those get renewed all the time, but the Russians have been you know, escalating, and Europe just pats itself on the back for renewing the same old, same old sanctions. Uh, Nord Stream 2 could be uh, a, a bit of a shock to Putin if the Germans did uh, surprise everybody and decide to, if, if not cancel it, at least suspend it until problems in Ukraine are resolved. Uh, Minsk is implemented, or some some you know serious uh, strategic uh, demand of the Russians. Uh, the CDU seems to be debating that. Uh, the new par party leader of the CDU has questioned, but not yet come out against Nord Stream Two. So uh, we should try to persuade them. And if they don't take persuasion, we should think about uh, sanctioning the companies involved in Nord Stream Two. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to follow up on that, Russian influence flows through gas pipelines. Right, and so the, it's not a commercial deal, Nord Stream 2. Uh, Russia's own analysts um, have said this in a massive report, and they were quickly fired for saying this, 
Um, so the Russians know what it is. And I think uh, we, we, the Germans have been in this, you know, kind of illusionary space for a long time, trying to convince themselves this is a commercial project. And I would just say that disinformation isn't just on social media. There's a great amount of disinformation about Russian gas and energy and, de and the kind of uh, dependence uh, that it creates vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe. So I do think Nord Stream 2 is a bad project. I don't necessarily think the, po the way the US has tried to get the Germans to act on it is resonating with Germany because the narrative there is, of course, well, uh, the US just wants to sell LNG to us, um, so they want us to be dependent on US gas versus Russian gas. Uh, but clearly for Russia, this is very much about Ukraine. It's about cutting off transit through Ukraine. It's very much about keeping dependence on Russian gas uh, within Europe. And so I think this project was should never have been approved from the start and should be suspended and halted. I think we've all talked about some very specific ideas as well when it comes to deterrence. I mean, very clearly, we don't have a deterrence strategy when it comes to information war. And we did. We did in the Soviet days uh, effectively deter the Soviet Union. We should remember that. Um, and Russia is not the Soviet Union. It doesn't have the same weight globally as the Soviet Union had. And so we dismantled all these institutions after the end of the Cold War, like the USIA, the US Information Agency, and we never reinvigorated them for the digital age. And so what I would want to see is a coherent, well-funded governmental interagency effort to come up with a strategy um, on how our messaging capabilities on our messaging to Russian speakers outside of Russia, maybe Russian speakers in Russia, ex uh, re-expanding RFERL to Hungary and Poland again, all of these things that we used to do, right? And you know, from my experience growing up in the Soviet Union, you know, I can tell you that the way we learned about what was really happening in the world was not from the Soviet media. It was from the BBC, Russian service, it was from Voice of America, and it was from Radio Liberty. And all of these things have been completely disseminated um, in terms of their funding and finances. So these are some very clear things that I think Congress could start thinking about doing. Another question. Uh, this gentleman four rows back, right here. Yes, sir. I'm Omar Abdul Malik. I'm executive director of the Cambridge Center for the Study of Religion and Public Policy. And my question is, um, has to do with uh, Trump's message of isolationism and uh, I'm a nationalist and things of that nature. And how does that counter or how does that juxtapose Putin's kind of emerging sense of Russian exceptionalism and a kind of a Soviet version of the Monroe Doctrine? And does that make it difficult for the US to have influence in that area since uh, it doesn't, uh, um, Trump is almost seen as a friend and ally of Putin. And All right, so a question to do with American versus Russian nationalism, right. exceptionalism. Andrea. My kind of, my first reaction when you're asking that question is kind of the focus that this administration has placed on notions of sovereignty and the nation state. And Pompeo was just in Europe and delivered a key speech to our European allies and partners that put front and center this idea that you know, this is a world order that we're going to advance that's based on the nation state and sovereignty. In my mind, that's an incredibly dangerous um, focus for US foreign policy. Ideas of sovereignty and nation state, and the sovereignty in particular, are the exact narratives that Russia and China use to convince other countries that they should avoid at all costs US efforts to support democracy. Um, and so in many ways, I think it gives these countries a free pass to say, like, we don't have to pay attention. We're going to pursue our own national interests, regardless of what the United States says. It also makes very difficult issues like the Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2 project. So if we now have a Germany that's saying, we want to pursue Nord Stream 2 because it's in our Germany's nat national interest, it's our own sovereign decision, then kind of what recourse does the United States have to engage um, in that kind of world? And so for me, I think this is a really um, uh, counterproductive, unproductive focus for a US foreign policy. Mm. I mean, you're hitting on a, a big theme, which is do we still have a common vision for the world order at a point when America is under President Trump, 
currently pursuing an America First agenda. We discussed London today in chaos, Paris not faring so much better, Merkel cycling her way toward the door in Germany. Do we still have a common view of what I mean, the transatlantic alliance and the world order should look like? I mean, I'm hostile, Bill to, and then Sandy. I'm hostile to Trump's view, understanding of nationalism and, and aspects certainly of his uh, touting of sovereignty, maybe slightly less hostile. And Andrea, but I mean, it, fine, if he's for national sovereignty, what about the Ukraine's national, what about Ukraine's national sovereignty or Georgia's national sovereignty? I mean, I don't actually believe all that stuff. I mean, that's just Trump's, that's rhetoric, which just disguises a desire not to get involved and a desire in some respects to side, frankly, with authoritarians against messy democratic allies who have less money and less money for personally for the Trump family and less, what well, arguably, you know, this is complicated with the Saudis, but less money generally for, various aspects of the U.S. economy or the U.S. Uh, political class or Trump supporters or whatever. So I think actually I'm very interested personally, you know, in these intellectual debates, but I also think we shouldn't give them too much dignity and think that, well, there's a real, like, gee, well, if you believe in sovereignty, I guess we can't do anything about Ukraine. Like, really? You know, aren't they a sovereign nation? Or are we now, where sovereignty is only sovereignty for, the, for Russia and for Saudi and for, the, for Saudi Arabia, if that even is a nation state, really, uh, and for China, where we can't say anything about a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, there there's sovereignty. But for Ukraine, Georgia, for Russian intervention in in other in funding, a lot of what some of what's happening, I don't want to overstate it, uh, some of what's happening in Central Eastern Europe and so forth. There, what happened to that great concern about sovereignty? Sandy, quick thought, and then we'll try to get yeah, a question I mean, over I here. I agree with Bill. I'm, in reading Pompeo's speech, you know, we shouldn't turn this into a doctrine because I think it, it really was, a, in a sense, a, an expression of cynicism and, and a totally transactional approach. And I think that's what the Russians pick up on. And, uh, you know, they, they can be much more cynical than we are because they don't have to, you know, to you know, pay lip service even to uh, Western values of the liberal international order. But uh, uh, that, I think, is the danger that uh, we give P Putin the sense that uh, it's all transactional and if he uh, wants to subjugate Ukraine, uh, you know, and we get something in return, we might make some kind of dirty deal. Mm. That's what, what, what I think the Ukrainians are worried about and that's why uh, you know, I hope the, the, the healthier-minded folks in the administration will continue to do what they can to work with the Europeans to help the Ukrainians to pro provide them more military aid also to keep their feet to the fire on democratic reforms and building their own democratic institutions uh, rather than succumbing to a more cynical, fatalistic approach. <laughs> Question from over here. This gentleman right here, about midway through the room. Good morning. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex Leibowitz, uh, formerly uh, also with uh, international organizations. Um, I was very interested in the comments about the uh, it seemed like the one thing that people really could point to was the increased sort of uh, military uh, actions in the eastern part of NATO. And although I, I also take uh, uh, Bill Crystal's point that sometimes, in fact, words maybe do speak louder than actions. But what about the fact that a, a lot of these, uh, the, the eastern European countries seem to be, some of them at least, the least hostile to Russia, least uh, sort of willing or eager to stand up to Russia, like Hungary, for example. Uh, doesn't this sort of undermine uh, what we're doing there, this, or, or am I missing something here? Thank you. Who wants to jump on that one? There's a danger of that. Uh, so far, we haven't seen that inside NATO uh, on, on sort of fundamental issues where, you know, there's been strong support for all the different initiatives that came out of the last summit, and Hungary is increasing its defense spending. On lesser issues, though, there's, you know, warning signs. Hungary has been blocking uh, high-level meetings with Ukraine because of a issue regarding the Ukrainian uh, education law and not allowing as much Hungarian language instruction. Uh, Turkey has disrupted some of NATO's partnerships with, uh, with Israel uh, a couple years ago. <coughs> But when push comes to shove on big issues, you know, they're, they're, they're part of the team. So uh, NATO has no mechanism for suspending membership or ejecting members, so we have to somehow continue to work things out. It's a consensus-based organization. But these kinds of uh, cases of countries who are playing footsie with the Russians or even de you know, developing uh, separate relations that we don't uh, feel comfortable about, uh, it, could, it could go from kind of minor irritant to disruption. <laughs> 
I also think it's worth noting too. I mean, even if from a even from political science research, when you look at um, the impact of regime type on cooperation between states, countries that have shared regime type tend to find more common ground in cooperation. And so, as we see some of this democratic erosion in places like Hungary and Poland, I think we should expect that there will be a greater foundation for cooperation with Russia. And when you kind of just look anecdotally about where we've seen democratic decline in some key countries. Turkey, Hungary, um, even places like Sri Lanka and other, other and the, Sri Lanka is actually the converse of that. But I think regime type is a, an important foundation for cooperation between states and it does open up the door, I think, for increased Russian influence and cooperation between states. No, I'm a huge just, believer in the, not just quickly, the, in the regime type question, but I mean, to be fair, if you're a small country right near Russia, you're gonna be, especially if you see an uncertain US, and uncertain big countries in Western Europe, you're gonna be more accommodating. And this was a big problem in the Cold War, was, or was perceived to be a problem in the Cold War, Finland, Austria, and so forth. And we managed, I mean, honestly, if you just step back to 30,000 feet, though these are all important problems to deal with, but I mean, you know, you really could have a crisis in six months that's way beyond any of this, and I think Germany would be the key. I mean, there is no NATO and no Western alliance without Germany. I mean, there is one, but it's a very different one. And uh, I don't know, how confident are we that Germany is just gonna be chugging right along as a pretty, you gotta say, I mean, pretty, to be fair, Bush made a bet in 1991 and it's paid off pretty well for 25 years. As a, and before that, on West Germany, I mean, uh, how confident are we that Germany just chugs along as a partner? How confident can they be of us? I mean, so honestly, we're not much of a position to be doing too much. I mean, I, I'm for the U.S. doing finger wagging at Hungary and Poland and actually putting real pressure on them because we still are uh, the spokes of the, the leader of, 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 of the pro-democracy forces, so to speak, the pro-liberal democracy forces. On the other hand, we, you know, it gets harder to the degree we're not living up to those standards. And on, in Germany, I think it's a slightly different question, but there I just really worry about that. The, 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 what's going to happen there? I think Marina, we, need last to word. Just quick, we do need to parse a few things out. Poland has been very mm -hmm. clear-eyed on the threat of Russian aggression, and there's no sense that I hear from anybody that we're going to see a flip towards some sort of pro-Russian view in that country. I think Orban is very clearly playing on both sides, but at the end of the day, these countries have been good players on the defense side. They have not wavered on their commitments. And I don't think it's productive if it's going to pour, you know, uh, I don't know, acid on, on Eastern Europe saying this, the problem is really there. Yes, there's issues on democracy, but that's a separate issue from their views about Russia and their continued commitment to uh, NATO military spending. Mm. All right, we've got time for one last one. I'm going to take it to the back of the room. Gentleman standing right under the clock with his hand up. There you go. Hi. Hi. Matthew Kennedy, I've recently finished a master's degree in Chinese politics from SOAS in London. My question, well, two of them. First, how can existing sanctions be improved or enhanced to give Russia pause in future actions against, be it the Ukraine or Georgia? And secondly, how can Washington entice or encourage the EU to improve its own sanctions against Russia? Thank you. How do we make the sanctions better? Alina. I think one very obvious um, area on the sanctions is some of the legislation has been under consideration in Congress already. Uh, the so-called DASCA legislation uh, that's being considered uh, would impose uh, quite harsh sanctions in the Russian energy sector. Uh, that's the Russian lifeblood uh, for the regime. Um, but I think we have to be very careful how we proceed because we don't ever want to send the message, in my view, that we're punishing the Russian population that are also suffering under this regime, mm -hmm. um, as we've seen in some of the recent uh, poll numbers, for example, um, and the quality of life and Russian life expectancy. All these numbers are quite, quite shocking if you look at them, um, the disparity between men and women, all of these things. Um, so there are ways in which we can make the sanctions hurt pretty badly, but I think the smarter move would be to focus specifically on those in the elite, yeah. in the Kremlin, on Putin and his cronies, who, who he uses to hide his own stolen assets that he, the, that he steals from the Russian public. Um, and I think that should be the focus, freezing those assets, exposing those assets. Beneficial ownership legislation is long overdue in this country. We're like the Cayman Islands right now when it comes to this. And that makes us uh, very vulnerable to illicit financial flows, money laundering, all of these things. We're allowing our institutions to be used for corruption and for supporting 
what is an adversarial America, adversarial regime in, in the Kremlin today. I just maybe will just foot stomp really quickly the, uh, like a focus on the Russian elite as the kind of most effective strategy for mm -hmm. sanctions. Um, in my view, I don't think sanctions are going to dramatically affect Putin's calculus. Um, they would. I, I just don't think that's going to happen under this regime. Um, so I think what we're playing for is in a, in a much lo is a much longer view of Russian politics, and so um, I think it's important to put the sanctions also in the context of context of what's happening domestically in Russia. Putin is at the end of his fourth kind of constitutional term that ends in 2024, and of course he can extend and find ways to stay. But I think for any dictatorship, this is a kind of a perilous moment where there will have to be a decision when he announces what his plans are to come next. And I think at this moment in Russia, you have a lot of elites who are probably at least lifting their head up a little bit to try to identify who is going to be the person who can best protect their own interests. And I think the questions are growing as to whether that's Putin. Um, will he be around after 2024? We don't know. And as sanctions mount, and increase the cost to the elite, I think it starts to kind of weaken the loyalty bonds. And it's not going to be enough, certainly, to destabilize the regime, but I think at least it positions us, should there be some sort of other exogenous thing that happens in Russia, that people might be more willing to jump ship. And so the, the sanctions that target the elite, I think, um, help us kind of plan or at least you know, be prepared in a contingency situation. I agree with, uh, with what was just been, what was just said. Uh, I mean, we, we imposed the sort of graduated sanctions back after the immediate aggression against Ukraine, in the hopes that uh, the Russians would live up to what they uh, agreed to at, at the, in the Minsk agreements. They clearly haven't, and so uh, we we do have to convince the Europeans, and we have to you know be more energetic in our diplomacy, because without a united front, it's not going to have any any impact on Russia. Uh, I agree with you know, targeting the cronies and the uh, the elite. This is, is this, we shouldn't expect this to change Putin's calculus, at least in the short or medium term. We have to recognize we're in a long-term competition with Russia, and I think that's the administration's t articulated policy in the national security strategy. Uh, sanctions are only one part of this struggle to kind of hold the line. We have to you know, push back when it comes to uh, uh, Russian military encroachments, keep what, doing what we're doing in NATO, support the neighbors directly, help them become more resilient, uh, fight back, as Alina was saying earlier, in terms of information warfare of our own. I mean, we're, we, we need to revive That's more. Exactly you don't suggesting. have to call. <laughs> no, but be, you know, don't fight uh, falsehoods with falsehoods. Fight f disinformation with, with, with the truth. Uh, but we have tools that are now underfunded, and we could be doing a hell of a lot more, as well as encouraging civil society, the private sector. To, uh, to engage more in uh, reaching out to the younger generation in Russia, which is, I think, not as enamored of, of Putin as, uh, as, as some older Russians and you know, could be uh, sort of the, the, the long-term solution. You know, the revival of interest in democracy and Western values could happen, if not while Putin's still in power, than in the years uh, following his uh, departure. And there you have it, a toolbox for months <laughs> and years to come, Sandy Mershbaugh. <laughs> Alina, Alina Polyakova, Bill Crystal, and Andrea Kendall Taylor. Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks, everybody, for that fascinating discussion, and in particular, the focus on outcomes. Um, I'm going to introduce the head of the uh, Secretariat of the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, which Jeff Gedman and I co-chair. The Secretariat dwells uh, at GMF, at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, the, uh, 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 Susan will talk to you a little bit about the purposes of our bipartisan transatlantic uh, democracy uh, efforts. Our members include scholars from Harvard, Stanford, and Georgetown, think tanks all over, not just GMF and Brookings, but also the Bipartisan Policy Center, CNAS, the Atlantic Council, uh, both of which are represented on our panel today, AEI, Carnegie, uh, and uh, civil society organizations like Freedom House and Human Rights First, uh, all coming together. Uh, to host, co-host, together with Brookings, GS, and FP today, uh, events like this one. We will have many more uh, in the coming year, uh, together with other activities, and I'd like to introduce Susan Cork now to tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> 
Come on up, Susan. Thank you, Ambassador Eisen. Um, and thanks. It's, hum it's humbling to stand up here after such an amazing group of speakers. Um, and the size of the audience, I think, shows the importance of having this event. Um, and thank you to our co-chairs and my bipartisan partners, Ambassador Eisen and Jeff Gedman, and Mary Louise Kelly. Thank you for masterful facilitation of a lively conversation. Um, I think all of our speakers today clearly showed the need for all of us, Republicans, Democrats, Americans, Europeans, Jews, Christians, Muslims, um, to see President Putin's incursions into the territorial integrity, political independence, and security of Europe and the United States as an existential threat to our way of life that must be countered with clear-eyed resolve um, and follow-up. Uh, Andrea noted that Putin sees any division as an opportunity. We can't give him that opportunity. Um, our transatlantic democracy working group came together to fight this very kind of threat. Um, we came together out of alarm that if we don't put aside our partisan bickering here in D.C. and stand together for democratic principles and institutions, our transatlantic security is at risk. Uh, the escalation of the Russian threat has given new impetus to this fight. This is not Putin's first provocation, nor will it be his last. Um, President Trump's initial response to the Russia-Ukraine crisis was, we don't like what's happening either way. Hopefully it'll get straightened out. <laughs> There's no either way. There are no sides. There's a way that's seeking peace and democracy, and there's one that is illegally posing an aggressive threat to our democratic security. That only gets straightened out if we take action together. Uh, the United States needs to be united with Europe through NATO and showing Russia unequivocally and with consequences that we will not tolerate or appeal, appease aggression. Uh, Putin is essentially putting forward a dare. He's gambling that he will be able to get away with this, this aggressive gamble and assert power beyond Russia's actual capacity. I loved Alina's man in a robot suit. I think any time we think that we're worried about Russia, think of that, the man in the robot suit. Um, but our shared transatlantic history has taught us through devastating loss of life, treasure, and territory what happens when we fail to respond adequately to the Russian regime's aggression. Um, I wanted to just briefly conclude by remembering and honoring Ludmila Mikhailova Alexeyeva. She was one of the fiercest and most inspiring human rights defenders in Russia and the world. She sadly passed away this weekend at 91. Um, for seven decades, she de defended the cause of human rights. Um, as we stiffen our own resolve to counter Russian aggression, she can be our light to lead our way. She was always crystal clear about what she was fighting for, why it matters, and why Soviet power and the autocratic Putin regime needed to be held accountable. And she knew how to get the message out. My fondest memory of her um, was sitting with her um, in her little kitchen surrounded by blue and white pottery as she recounted with a twinkle in her eye the New Year's Eve protest in Moscow when she dressed up as an 82-year-old snow queen. That night, the police beat her with a baton. Um, she was delighted by that, by the way. That was an image that went around the world, and she was then herded into a police van, and then the police realized who she was. They tried to avert a public relations disaster by letting her go, and she refused. She said, I will not go until you let everybody else go. And they reluctantly did let everybody go. And she planned that strategy, too. She knew that they'd let them all go, and she had planned already a festive New Year's party for all of the protesters to go to after jail. She made fighting for freedom and democracy fun. So I think we need to find, again, that sense of ascendancy and optimism. Um, she stood up to Russia time and again, never backing down, never lost her optimism. And the fire she brought to fighting for our freedom kept her alive, fighting till the end. She said, today's young people give me the feeling of not having lived in vain. I think that she would have a sense of how to respond to Putin's dare. Question is, will we? We have many important events important anniversaries in the year ahead for NATO and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Let's use this as a call to action. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.